A decade after buying our home, my husband and I finally decided to remodel our 1970s bathroom. Now, I've just given birth to our second child, and as if I didn't already have enough on my plate, I eagerly volunteered to manage the entire project. Besides, the contractor assures us the whole thing will only take four weeks to complete. Well, <laughs> four weeks turned into nine very long weeks, but in the end, we got the beautiful bathroom we wanted. So here I am, standing in my newly remodeled bathroom, admiring the genius of my design. The eye-catching sapphire blue tile, the elegant waterfall faucet, the ultra-modern dual flush toilet. But my favorite is the medicine cabinet, which is covered in mirrors inside and out. This thing is stunning. Looking in the mirrors, I'm surprised to find myself overcome with emotion. My throat tightens, my heart beats faster, and I'm welling up with tears as memories transport me back to my childhood. It is the 1980s in Medellin, Colombia. Medellin is a large city nestled in a valley within the Andes Mountains. And I live in the suburb of the city in what feels like a pigeon coop with my parents and two younger sisters. The living conditions in our tiny apartment are dire. For instance, our electrical wiring is a catastrophe just waiting to happen. We have exposed live wires that hang from the ceilings and creep down the walls like vines of poison ivy. Our semi-functional bathroom has no door, no sink, and no medicine cabinet. And our toilet has no tank, which means we have to fill up a big bucket of water to flush it. And hot water is a luxury we can't afford, so I take icy cold showers every morning before school. The place is also infested with vermin. We have a mouse nest in the closet, but the baby mice are actually really cute, so I beg my mom to keep them, but she doesn't. And at night, I am creeped out by the cockroaches I hear flying above my head. Yes, they fly. Since we're on the top floor, we have a terrace where I spend a lot of time hanging out, just staring into the distance. And no matter which direction I look into, all I see are the Andy Mountains. They are enormous and truly majestic. Strangely, the view makes me feel claustrophobic. I am surrounded and I can't escape. There's unspeakable violence happening outside my door. The infamous drug lord Pablo Escobar and the drug cartels are spilling blood everywhere, but there's no one to turn to because there's corruption at every level. Crimes against human rights are taking place every day. Children are recruited to become killers. People are displaced. Some are disappeared. Many are tortured, and the murder rate keeps climbing. One afternoon while I was outside riding bicycles with my younger sister and our friends, we heard gunshots. We ran as fast as we could and we hid at the entryway to my apartment and shut the door behind us. But I quickly realized that my sister wasn't with us. I felt tremendous pressure on my chest as if I were being crushed with stones and I could hear the blood pulsating in my head. Instinctively, I pushed the door open and I ran out to find her. She was standing in the middle of the street, straddling her bike. She was all alone and looked absolutely terrified. When I got to her, I wrapped my scrawny arms around her as if I could somehow shield her from what was happening. A man with a gun came running toward us. He was so close, I felt a breeze as he sped past us. Not long after this incident, I'm woken up by a deafening sound. The blast was so loud, it shattered the window of my bedroom. I was really scared, but I ran out to the terrace anyway with my parents to find out what was going on. The sun hadn't even come up yet, but all of our neighbors were outside too, and they looked just as distressed as we were. Later that day, I learned that a car bomb had exploded in a very wealthy neighborhood not very far from where I live. The bomb, which was an attempt against Pablo Escobar, was so powerful, it was felt within a three-mile radius, and it left a huge crater on the ground. This bombing set into motion the most violent time Colombia has ever seen. Around the same time, I also learned that my grandfather was trying to help my family migrate to the States. You see, my grandfather fought in the Korean War for the American Army, and as a veteran, he was granted U.S. citizenship and had been living in the States for many years. His status would help us apply for residency. 
So to cover the cost of the visa applications and to make the trip from Medellin to Bogota, where the U.S. Embassy is located, my grandfather sent us a few hundred dollars, which my mom kept hidden in an armoire. One day we came home and found the place a complete mess. Somebody had broken into the apartment and had taken many items, including the money we were saving for our visa applications. But miracles do happen. Somehow we raised the money again and we are all granted U.S. visas. It is now 30 years later and I am back in my beautifully remodeled bathroom and I realize I've been crying. But my daughter doesn't notice. She's been sick with a cold and is now complaining about a headache. So I quickly compose myself and I reach inside the medicine cabinet to find the children's ibuprofen. I take her into her bedroom and I cuddle her to sleep. And in this moment, I feel immense gratitude that my daughters are growing up in a very different world. But I question whether I'm being too overprotective. I'm constantly shielding them from the dangers that lurk every day. You know, scraped knees, hurt feelings, catching a cold. Not from shootings as I once did with my younger sister. I think about their future. When the time will come for me to tell them these stories and how our family finally broke free from the violence. And no matter how much I try to shield them, the world's hardships will find them. I wonder, what will my daughter see in this mirror when they are all grown up? Thank you.